Hello, everybody. Um, welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to really welcome everybody in a particular way uh, because some of you here remember that the idea to have this track started in, uh, at the end of February in Appeldoorn in the Netherlands at the Ospology Live session, also moderated by Anna, who will moderate our closing panel today. So it's like a whole arc here. And um, there, I had this hunch to ask the audience if um, the people there who represented many public sector actors um, would like a track at the Open Source Summit Europe to discuss like specifically um, public sector collaboration open source. The answer was a sur surrounding yes, like everybody raised their hand and said yes please. So here we are six months later, this is the track today. Um, so I'm very happy that you're all here. We have a great lineup of presentations and um, I really look forward to kind of creating bridges and connections here between various um, actors in this space. And uh, just to make things a bit more enticing, um, based on the feedback on this track today, we intend to make this a regular track at the Open Source Summit. Um, at the moment, we're speaking about Europe, but I'm trying to convince the events team that this could actually be something that we run at the Global Open Source Summit, so like different with North America, Europe, and um, Japan. And maybe we can even get it there. So we'll definitely have one next year in Europe as well. Um, so when you're asked to provide feedback later, then um, please provide it. And with that, um, yeah, as I said, welcome. First presentation, you're up. Have fun. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Yeah, okay. Okay. Great. Welcome. Um, let's, let's start it off. And uh, because we're here to, to inspire you here today with our story, um, and hopefully it, it speaks to you and you have uh, some follow up to, to uh, take with you. So our story sort of begins two years ago here at the Open Source Summit Europe. And in that case, it was in Ireland, in Dublin. And I was there for the first time in the Open Source Summit. You as well? Yep. And um, we were having an OSPO for a brief, uh, for a couple of years already and um, trying to set things up. And so was the Dutch tax office, uh, and we'll do some introductions uh, about that later. But so we were in somewhat of a similar situation, and then a, a mutual friend or acquaintance, uh, Thomas Steinbergen, um, involved in, in many uh, Linux Foundation projects, saw an opportunity like, oh, the Dutch tax office and Alejandro are, are here on the same conference. They should really get talking to each other and start collaboration, maybe. And because we were already in, in a conversation about setting up an Ospology Live event in, in, um, in the Netherlands. I think you were also with the tax office, right? Yeah. Yeah. They will come to the later. Yeah. Um, and then we, we bumped into each other at dinner uh, already, brief conversations. But on the second to last day, finally, uh, lunch was not served at the venue. We had to go outside. We managed to actually go to a pub and have fish and chips. And then and there, we decided, OK, we have so much um, things that are, are in common, even though we are totally different organizations. Um, let's, let's start a collaboration. And that commitment has, has held. And I think about half a year later, we had uh, at Aleander, um, we had the Ospology Live event in the Netherlands. And of course, you see on the right, you see, uh, well, Robert from the back, maybe you can recognize him, but, um, and Carol from the Dutch tax office. Uh, having a presentation, we had other representatives, of course, of the Linux Foundation, uh, like InnoSource, uh, To Do Group, uh, Chaos, um, and we had a, a great event. And I think uh, there we we started something in the Netherlands about open source, OSPOs, and started a collaboration. And in yeah. next year, the, the year after. We were able to start an event in Apron also, an Ospology Live in Apron. Here you have some pictures. Nikki is also in the audience, also there on the uh, top right, uh, bottom right. Um, came from the year before. What w could we do as an OSPO? Where could we share our own knowledge? Um, what did we learn from the years? What did we learn from Aliander? What did we learn from the to do group? And share it even. Uh, yeah, Alain is on the podium. Oh, he's also there. He's on the podium on the left. Um, where we could, were able to share our knowledge and, and 
just keep the community going and growing. Um, but I think we forgot something, uh, Nico. That's the next one. Um, the introduction of myself. Um, my name is Karl Rietveld. I work at the Dutch Tax and Custom Administration at the Chief Technology Office. Um, I run the OSPO together with a couple of colleagues that are also here. Um, back to you. Okay. Um, and I'm um, working at the Open Source Program Office we have at uh, Aliander. We're a Dutch uh, grid operator. Um, doing about a third of the electricity and gas distribution uh, in the Netherlands. And um, yeah, mainly supporting the projects, making them a success because we have our own open source projects as well and also some, uh, some internal compliance. Um, but kind of, yeah, different than Carol, we have multiple people in sort of half time roles in the OSPO. So some, some similarities. You, you want to pick that off? Or? Is I going to look at the screen now? <laughs> Um, similarity, so as Nico and I, but also Jonas, uh, we had a lot of discussions during the different summits, uh, the different conferences where we spoke to each other and found actually quite a lot of similarities. Like we're a large organization, Alianda is a large organization, we have a big IT department. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of knowledge uh, already available, uh, not coordinated um, in the open source way. So there wasn't an OSPO, uh, which we actually started in 2022. So we came a little bit later than the Alianer. Um, we have a lot of staff, IT staff over three and a half thousand. So it's a lot of knowledge we can use as an open source uh, program office. Yes, we're both Dutch. So that's easy. Uh, talking in Dutch is uh, sometimes easier than, uh, than English or German. Um, um, but also the way we work is Dutch, so we are quite open, uh, quite direct, um, quite willing to share the knowledge that we have. Uh, sharing the knowledge between the different organizations was actually quite easy. Let's show what we already built, let's share the ideas we already have in building an OSPO. Um, so that was helpful. Uh, yes, we're both an OSPO, uh, but as the group says, your OSPO is not my OSPO. So yes, there are similarities, but based on the organization, it's uh, quite different. That's a similarity, but also different. Um, and the question we actually had as an, as an uh, OSPO within the Dutch text is how to get useful insights. So what are we actually using as an organization? What kind of different software components with the different licenses we have in? in our organization. That was a big question for us. It was my main goal as an OSPO starting in 2022. It's still one of the main goals. Like what are we using? Are we compliant? Similarity with Aliander. What are, we, what are they using? Are they compliant? Um, yes, publicly funded. So we're a public administration, publicly funded. Same as Aliander, publicly funded. Um, and we're not a vendor, we're not, yes, we're creating software, but we're not selling anything. We're not allowed to um, make money. So we have to break even. That's quite obvious. Um, what about differences, uh, Nico? Yeah, what about differences? Um, so we're totally different sectors, right? Energy and, uh, and tax. Um, <laughs> and I think there's in, 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 in the sector wise, of course, there's IT for IT. We have uh, Kubernetes clusters, things like that. But other than that, the domain is is very different. Um, uh, the legislative uh, framework we're in is different. Um, the kind of management um, uh, <laughs> we might have might be different. Uh, and uh, some are public versus public. So uh, you are a public uh, body. Um, I know there's a freedom of information request about getting the source code from the government because uh, citizens have some rights uh, on that in the Netherlands. Uh, whereas we are, operate as a business, it just happened to be that we grew from uh, grids from municipalities and provinces and we, we grew bigger over time by, through mergers. So uh, we are still publicly owned, but we are operated as a, as a company. So they are more like shareholders. And so we have to do the right thing and uh, provide reliable uh, grid, um, have to think about our cost, but we're not as, as bound to um, strict regulation like a government. Um, but it, it's really, uh, it makes sense to collaborate with uh, more strict public uh, organizations. And, and that's also, I think, where the, the open by choice, open by policy comes from. You have stronger obligations uh, about being open 
than we have. Uh, the change uh, at, at Allianz really came when we said, okay, the energy transition is coming for us as a grid operator. We need digital innovation. We first did that a lot in-house, uh, in-house software development, uh, like at the similarities, we have IT as well. And then as, at a point it was like, okay, uh, let's collaborate in the open. There was an intention to collaborate. So uh, the project we opened up was, uh, was by choice, not by, uh, by policy. Um, yeah, and <laughs> we operate as a business. So sometimes it, it can be that the procurement is easier for us, I guess. Um, even though for, for larger things, we have to uh, meet similar requirements, publicly funded. Um, so, so let's introduce our, our OSPOs uh, that we built over the years. So at Aliander, um, and, and I've seen this slide uh, also by the BBC and uh, um, over the years, like we have some, some focus groups. Um, we do a lot of consumption. Historically, we have, uh, a, a, think of Linux servers, Postgres database, right? Uh, but, and all the libraries that are in software development. Um, just the, the, the open source consumption, and I think it's it's grown more and more. And this is something we are concerned about um, with the OSPO, making sure that we keep an eye on what is actually being used, if we can establish a policy on how best to use it, maybe some strategic um, efforts as well. And then it, it gets more fun when we actually start doing contribution. Um, when I was in a team with Kubernetes, it was a custom that if we encountered something that we could contribute, we actually submit a patch upstream for the benefit of us, not having to maintain it, but the benefit of others as well. And I think over time, more and more uh, people in our organization are now empowered to actually contribute because there are guidelines uh, on what you can do, how you should do it. Uh, and these are now um, carried, yeah, the, the, the policies by the OSPO. The inner source, we have uh, some groups uh, within the company that are tightly knit and then it makes sense to work across teams on solutions and uh, we're trying to serve that as best as possible uh, with, with guidelines and actually today we have a, a workshop, uh, our colleagues at the OSPO are hosting a workshop in one of those groups, like how can we better collaborate, so that's one of the things um, we're doing. And then I think that the most fun part is the, the actually creation, taking an internal project or creating a new one and making that open source. And a, a lot of things um, are needed to, to do that. And that brings us to our, our second slide about the Alejandro OSPO. It's like, what did we do over the years? When we began our OSPO in 2020, this came of the need to start collaborating under the umbrella of the Linux Foundation Energy. And you see these two projects on the left. Those were sort of the easy ones. You see the, the grid exchange fabric was actually a rebranding of uh, existing open source project that was also already out. And we had the, the Compass project. There was a, a newly created project. So right from the get go, we could um, start something new. And then it became a bit harder where we actually uh, took internal projects, uh, most predominantly an energy forecaster, open staff, and a, a grid calculating engine, power grid model, which had a history of, of years and years of development internally that we went through the OSPO process and released. And yeah, we're still going, uh, releasing more and more stuff, uh, including uh, two weeks ago at the Linux Foundation Energy, uh, we also introduced the, the tooling we use at the OSPO ourselves to check these projects, the OSPO code scanner. You, so if you look at that at Aliander OSPO code scanner, you can find the, the, the workflow we use. And well, let's see the, the similarities and differences for the tax office. Yeah, actually there are quite a lot. Um, based on what we started in 2022, we see a lot of similarities. Uh, like I will go to the next slide immediately because we have exactly the same uh, parts we are interested in. Like, are we using uh, software as we should intend? So we are over 80% of our software is open source. Uh, what we're building ourselves, so based on open source. Uh, focusing also on contributions, like if we're a good user of open source project, we should also contribute back. That's for now still a bit of a challenge, but well, it is one of our focus, uh, main focuses. Um, and third one about publishing, like we have the law, uh, open unless. Um, that brings with a lot of challenges, like we should 
open source by default, open source our own projects by default. But it's a bit of a challenge if you're an organization that's really tied together and keeping everything inside. So we try and working on opening um, our own software by helping the colleagues and helping management, convincing that it's safe to open source our own software. Um, but you have to find different procedures to get there. So it took a lot of time to actually open source a project. We're not there yet, but closely. So I don't have a slide about what have we open sourced yet, but it's, it's really close. Um, I'm not allowed to say when and where, but uh, it will be there. Um, still focusing about what we're using and how to get the right correct details on the insights and what we're using. Um, and the biggest questions we get as an OSPO, how to do that? Where, where and when can I open source projects? What do I need to do to get there? So focusing about guidelines, how to see what you're using, how to work on the different policies and the different uh, licenses. So we're building open source how-tos and sharing that knowledge with the different colleagues. Um, the how-tos are mainly focused about these uh, areas. Um, if we want to use a new product with our organization, we build a checklist, like what do we need to know? Um, looking at maintainability, for example, is the project we're using uh, highly maintained by the uh, open source community? Um, how is support being uh, arranged? So yes, we have the channels of procurement. So yeah, we want to use something, but if it's so, if there's a support model, we need to find out if we're allowed to do that or it's a long running uh, process to get the software internally. Um, and the third one, the yellow one is actually, uh, which we're focusing on and having a big challenge around. Do we already have some sort of function in our organization? As we are a big IT company, we probably have it, um, but do we have it somewhere that everybody knows of? Um, so it's a yellow area like, we're not entirely sure we already have something about that. So we're working on that. We should be working on that. Um, and also the publishing framework, like security is a big issue in our organization. So are we allowed to open our own projects? Are we safe enough? Are there any vulnerabilities in the software? Are we quite sure that we don't have any uh, internally information based in our projects? So that's a main focus area. That's why it's on the top. Um, and if you open source our own project, do we have any compliance issues? So do we're checking the licenses. Um, and do we have any goals around the open sourcing of our own projects? Yes, we want to share what we build, but do we want to use the community or do we want to just be open? So what's the goal of a project to open up? But the, this is just an introduction. I believe, you too, I believe. Um, so where did we collaborate? So we started up in, uh, in Dublin, eating fish and chips. Thank you very much, Thomas, for arranging that. Um, but it's actually, uh, looking back, that was a starting point of collaboration between a public sector and a semi-public sector. Um, we, we grew from the two uh, different organizations into, I believe, is 18 now. So we created a, a working group internally in the Netherlands with different organizations, um, uh, with the Ministry of Internal Affairs, with um, municipalities. Well, I can... Yeah, province, uh, provinces. Uh, um, so we grew just by starting and eating fish and chips and having a collaboration on details, like what are your insights? What do you need? Um, and we continued that just by bi-weekly meetings, sharing the different knowledges, for example, about s um, how to do that, what is the upside from it, but also what's the downside of it. Um, and we have an open framework for that. It's a, there's an open website for that, uh, and we shared our knowledge within the Git, GitHub repository so everybody can see it, it's open. Um, and we're making visible what we're using. So if we learn something, we share it usually by you the first time and then the rest. So that's interesting. Um, uh, and we just let it grow. So it's internally story. We, we open up our own stories. What was actually the idea behind it? And then we open it up and sharing the knowledge and learning from that. Um, is there one for you? 
Yeah, that's good. Um, so, so on the right, you see, um, Carl just mentioned, uh, we, we started with a public knowledge base. Um, we, at, at the beginning, I think we, we started that off at Topology Live in, in Amsterdam, um, during these bi-weekly meetings, what can we contribute? Because everybody has an internal policy, um, but how can we share it and ideally um, get to something that is uh, beneficial to everybody? It's it's, uh, these policies are in Dutch. They are focused on um, the Dutch context. So it, it would make sense also to collaborate with the Do Do group, of course. Um, and uh, I think many of us are uh, uh, see if we can contribute and following along. Uh, but this was just uh, in a smaller context in the Netherlands, uh, the idea to bring together all the resources we already developed internally. And, and so we did just, just one example. And uh, we are now also collaborating uh, on, on the bottom with these uh, bi-weekly meetings with the planner board, where we have put more and more structure in, uh, in these meetings in the Netherlands. And it's, it's growing very organically. And another th thing that was already existing is that it was um, uh, by the Dutch government, I think it's by the Ministry of Internal Affairs, um, there was already a, a, a website about open source, using open source, some guidelines, uh, they had developed a course um, uh, for, for um, do you say civil servants? Yeah, yep. to, um, uh, to learn about open source. And um, we got in contact uh, with that team and uh, are now collaborating on that. So I think um, it would be too much credit to say, okay, we were in Dublin and we kickstart all of this. No. Um, and, Every individual organization uh, we got in contact with was willing to collaborate, and um, at least we had a, a strong foundation, a, a commitment to, to uh, collaborate. And then we could uh, tag along uh, others, and it, it's like a, a, snow, um, a snowball getting bigger and bigger. And all these existing uh, projects like this website uh, certainly became part of this uh, bigger movement. That is, and we'll get to that, is, is we're still looking to, how do we structure this properly? Um, and, and I think that's, uh, that's organic, but it, it, we're growing over time and um, yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah. So quality, quality control. Um, if you're building software, you also want to know what's the quality of the software. So we, we had a, a, quite a couple of discussion on what kind of software are you using? And we use this as a um, project to validate our um, our software on the quality. But also, we were very inter interested in how to get the insights of what we're actually using within that um, project. So we are able to add a addition on the software um, to get the useful insights to do some sort of investigation in software composition analysis. What kind of different um, libraries dependencies are in the project? But it was a little bit of a mess. Um, for us, at least, it was a little bit, a bit of a mess and a challenge to get the proper information. So we talked to Nico, like, hey, do we have to sell the same issue? Well, sort of the same issue. Um, there wasn't a useful dashboard where you could see um, what are you actually using. Searching for the different dependencies, different libraries was a bit of a challenge, still is a bit of a challenge. Um, so at least we moved over to a different um, different product, um, which I'll get to with the next slide, I see. Um, but also the scorecards, like you mentioned the, um, the framework you built, the, the, the checker, um, which we actually try to use internally and running the same um, uh, tools internally, but we're using it internally, not by GitHub Action, but internally. So that's a bit of a more challenge. But looking and talking about that idea um, really helped us to see if we're able to see the different um, functions and the uh, issues we found in our software. So scorecard is actually one that's also running, but it has a little bit of challenges internally, so it needs to have a lot of information. But at least it gets one of the insights. But the second thing, the most important thing actually, where we discussed, we're missing a lot of details, we're missing a lot of information within the project. Why don't we start using the software bill of material? So actually in Bilbao, I had a lot of sessions about that. We had co quite a couple of discussions about, hey, shouldn't there be a framework or some sort of standardization? 
Uh, we talked about S bomb. So this is the image I got last year. When to generate an S bomb? It gave me a, quite a useful insight. Okay, so that's the place where I should st start building an S bomb, creating an S bomb, centralizing an S bomb, uh, do analysis of the S bomb, uh, have all the information available, give an overview of all the information that I really wanted. So this is just an image I I created the picture last year, and it was for me really a helpful insight. That was the discussion we started like, are you doing the same? Yeah, we're doing the same. What are we doing in proof of concept and what are you using? Uh, so we shared knowledge about the format. Uh, we shared knowledge about what kind of tool we're using. We had some discussions, even with Thomas, like, do you need to use this tool? Do you need to use that tool? Is the SPDX or Cyclone DX format the, the correct format? So we had a, also a discussion with our interest group in the Netherlands. And that came up with the idea, why don't we file a request for having the standardization of the software bill of material? So together with the, all the different uh, organizations, we came up with an idea to put up a request to the form for standardization to have the software bill of material standardized in uh, the Netherlands. So it's running. We don't know if it's already uh, there's no date yet, as far as I know. Um, but we at least filed it based on what we learned, based, based on the experience via, via Leander and via ourselves. Also a colleague uh, from Social, Ministry of Social, Welfare. Social Welfare, thank you. Um, so that what was quite, um, nice actually to see figuring out what are your needs what are the different standards what is the opinion about different colleagues in the netherlands different organizations in the netherlands and it helped us filing a, a, a standard at least a request for standardization um, and that came up with well we should start actually building automation on that so if we know where do we, where we want to start building pipelines creating a standard for the for uh, for s bombs in the pipelines actually came up with, we're currently running in production all different uh, platforms with the S-BOMS. We still have some challenges, but at least we have quite a lot of information already. So it's helpful. And now we can see a lot of details and we can see where we need to focus on. Um, actually, the yellow image I created. What are we actually using in our organization? Is it viable? Are we still okay with that? So it gives us n even more insights in the S-BOMB. Yeah, and... Uh the S bomb topic, I think, is in the Netherlands a hot topic, and uh, I learned a lot from your work um, and experiences. And what I find interesting is that everybody who's working on this is working on different. Um, it's coming from a different experience level or a different level of implementation, and uh, so it's also addressing other aspects. So. I think you have a lot of experience with uh, making it work, the technical uh, parts. Um, we are now um, trying to get it organized in the organization, uh, getting uh, a team responsible for storing the S-bombs and collecting them. So it's more um, the, the, the architecture and um, the, well, the, the policy maybe. And the um, uh, social welfare, um, they are working more on a, a higher management uh, policy, like how do we, what is the place, the role of SBOMs in our organization. And so these are all different aspects addressed by different organizations, but we now have a, um, a forum to uh, share this knowledge. And another topic we collaborate on is uh, more the policy. And as at Aliander, we've been open sourcing multiple uh, projects over the years. We've sort of refined our pro internal process. And uh, this was um, uh, the most recent slide we created at the LF Energy presenting this. Um, and we did some automation on it as well, uh, which we then shared with, uh, with the tax office. Like, okay, you can use this internally, both the automation and uh, the, the checklist and the, the, the topics, because uh, it could help you. Um, so, but of course, this is just the, the aspects of open sourcing, just one uh, of, the, of the policies, but also uh, on how can you actually use, so when it comes to your slide, I think your slide was a good overview of all the aspects of, of policies you might want to have in an OSPO. Um, and so then again, um, all the organizations might have a 
mature policy in one of these areas, and if you pull them together, um, maybe picking the best, um, or at least share them around, you can uh, make great strides uh, together to, to improve the policies internally. And of course, they might deviate because you're uh, bound by different rules or you have um, a different, different internal um, uh, strategy. So you might not do a one-to-one -one copy of a policy, but at least you get inspiration from the policy of somebody else. Yeah, coming back to the growing of the community, we, yes, we have uh, on the top, we have the OSPO and L coordination. So we have a working group that's coming bi-weekly together. There are also different uh, groups within the working group already organized about building a community, um, but also, Fairly looking at internal collaboration. How can we collaborate in the Netherlands together, sharing the knowledge, having a safe space to talk about, um, having a centralized place where you can share all the different knowledge. For example, on GitHub, is it the correct place for sharing the knowledge or using Playo, our own uh, platform? So just looking at where and when can we share our information together in the collaboration. Um, yeah, as once we already touched it uh, quite uh, a lot, um, we're we are actually one of the first that's actually working on as bombs, implementing as bombs, having the information about the as bombs, and all the different organizations are looking at us like, okay, what can we learn from you? Where do we get, where do you find information? How do we do that? Um, the other way around, we. We're working on an open source policy. It's not directly implemented. So there's an open unless policy letter in the Netherlands, but you haven't implemented the open source policy within the Dutch tax administration. So it's still something to work on. Um, and about communication. So we have uh, one colleague that's doing the communication for the open source network, the Dutch network. So sending out newsletters, finding out new different information from different organizations. So building a community, asking questions, sharing the knowledge, what we are internally discussing and making it work. Um, so that's actually quite great. Yeah, open source AI, uh, I think it's a hot topic. Last year was a big topic, still is a hot topic. I believe it will be a hot topic for the next years. Um, as a public administration, it's kind of hard to use open source and AI. Um, we're not there yet. Hopefully we'll get there at some point. Um, but getting the insights from other organizations, if they're easier to use it, where can we implement it as a, a government entity? Also looking at you, if you're implementing it, are we allowed to do that in the same way or a little, little bit different way? That's um, very useful. And sharing the open knowledge is really helpful. Um, so this is an overview of what we're doing in building a community uh, for the Netherlands, hopefully bigger than only the Netherlands. And uh, next year, maybe more than 18, hopefully. Um, any yet? Yeah, um, to, to maybe just add to that. So, so this is sort of the organization structure that is trying, it's starting to show itself. I right? have a bi-weekly uh, central meeting and then we have some working groups that could work independently. Um, I know the, the communication and community that's really writing blogs on different topics. They've they had some uh, writing workshops with experts to, to learn how best to write a blog and get the communication across. Um, and there's some also some ideas to start an international collaboration because we know uh, well, Germany is close. Uh, they have some interesting uh, governmental uh, open source uh, projects and organizations. Uh, but the, uh, uh, some of them uh, of, the, of the community went to the Ospos for good. So there was a lot of international contacts uh, established there. And of course, it has conferences like here today as well. Um, so there's an opportunity to, to collaborate internationally and, uh, and do that too. Uh, so this is not formalized. Maybe we'll do that over the coming year. We'll see. But I think um, we, we can come to a sort of a conclusion and that's more like a, a, a call to all of you here and, and unfortunately it's on the last day uh, but maybe you have some some other days and still the lunch to go that this started all of this collaboration in the netherlands in the public sector semi-public uh, started with for us at least it, um, a commitment having fish and chips and saying okay we have enough uh, similarities um, enough shared goals shared ambitions so let's work together and see where we can help each other out. And over time, this, this grew bigger and bigger. 
And so if you find an organization that is as similar, that you see the opportunity to collaborate, then please make that commitment uh, because who knows, it might be the, the, the good foundation for a larger collaboration. Thank you. All right, I see, I see questions already. Oh, yeah. Sure, no, I can, I can talk very well. Yes, for the recording. Okay. Um, so thank you for your talk. It's really interesting, um, especially the SBOM topic. So I work for the uh, OSPO in the German Employment Agency, a really large organization. And um, it's, it's really difficult to even within the organization to get some common standards to make our work easier. So when you talk about SBOM and uh, software composition analysis, um, we even struggle to find common CICD technologies, pipelines and stuff like that. So it's really difficult. And I think SBOM is a really good way to uh, say, okay, you can use whatever you want if that's what you want to do, but at least give us a standard format so we have like a way to see what's what's going on. Um, is that your experience, that this is maybe the right uh, approach? And also, I would love to hear what your goal is to find a common standard. How do you approach it to actually find the right, or the, the common standard that everybody can agree on for an SBOM format or something like that? So a really broad question, but... Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll make the introduction and then Carol can go into detail, but... Um... I have the same um, idea that at least uh, there's so many teams using different CRCD, uh, trying to standardize, it's actually part of my job, um, but it's it, really difficult, it will take a long time, and at least it's a, it's a clear interface. So I see a lot of opportunity there of SBOMs um, being part of the puzzle, but I, I just now trying to find um, a, a team taking that, uh, taking that on, and I think you have more experience with that already. Yeah, I'm more experienced on that. Uh, I think of today still there's a struggle of what kind of standard is the best standard. And there's a sort of conflict or interest between the different standards. So, sort of. So, they're moving a little bit closer and there's a migration. Yeah, Thomas is there, so we're talking about s is really, if you want to know more about s you should really ask Thomas questions. Um, but, uh, over the last half years, I see the two different standards, two biggest standards, moving a little bit more uh, to each other. So we just picked not SPDX, but we picked Cyclone DX based on uh, what we a year ago thought was the best idea. We still think it's the best idea. We just picked the standard based on what was our interest. And based on that, we were able to build default pipelines, be, create standardization around, uh, around the different pipelines. And we well, I'm from technology innovation perspective also, so I have do, two hats, but I don't want to talk about too, that too much. Um, so we just started a proof of concept, building it around the pipelines, different pipelines we had, uh, standardized the pipelines, uh, just made it part of the standard of the pipelines we already had, and just let it grow. So as an OSPO, you start talking about different uh, organizational units, and that's what we did. Um, so the best advice would be, Start off small and spread the word uh, and choose a standard of what's best for you. That could be yes, Cyclone DX, could be uh, SPDX. But actually what we did as a, uh, as a standard for the whole Netherlands, we picked them both. It wasn't about being Cyclone DX or SPDX, it was build an S-bomb. So start off small, pick one, talk about the S-bomb and not talking about a different specification. Because the details is more important than the standard. I saw another question, right? Yeah. Hi, I wondered about the communication between the groups in between meetings. Sorry, I didn't get the question. The communication, how do you communicate between groups? Yeah, I, I think that's a... Multiple different ways. So um, we have um, an email thread that is growing in the number of email addresses and subscribers um, because there's no mailing list servers. Um, 
We have a GitHub um, planner board with, with issues on it. And we have regular meetings um, that are hosted um, in, within this community and um, that we know uh, like this time, uh, this date, this hour, there will be a meeting. Um, so that's, that's pretty much the way to communicate. Um, to there's the to-do yeah. Slack as well uh, with some of the people represented there. Um, so I, I'd say it's far from perfect. Um, but it, yeah, at least we got some. Huh? It works yeah, it works somehow. Yeah, we know uh, to get in touch. Yeah. Yeah. To add to that, we are, we started small with a with a couple of um, uh, different organizations, and just by adding new organizations to that uh, meeting, uh, we added more people, more organizations to the meeting notes to the meeting itself. Uh, you see multiple meetings coming up. Uh, the meetings are changing quite a lot with new people being added, some are being uh, removed. So, um, yeah, sometimes it's a challenge what kind of uh, platform we're using to have a meeting, but at least we're there. We're talking about uh, uh, open source together. Um, it's a challenge because different organizations, different tools, it's tough. But um, if you know to find each other, WhatsApp or what kind of different communication uh, to-do group, uh, we're using it, uh, also uh, the Slack channel. Just start. That's Sounds funny, but yeah, we just started. We started with WhatsApp, I believe. I even awesome. sent you uh, normal, regular messages, right? Yeah, text. Yeah, yeah. Text, yeah. Yeah, yeah. text messages. So, yeah, I think I think that's important one. Yeah. Don't get hung up on no. where do we host. I mean, that's often the first question. Where are we gonna host it? Just create something and find the persons. To what I mean. I think we moved over from WebEx to uh, Teams to all different sort of canals. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your experience. So, Carol, you've mentioned that uh, Dutch Tax Office has an open source, open source policy. And uh, do you mean that all of your software that you develop and use must be open source? Is it also apl applicable to all public administration? Or maybe you can share some uh, info. To, to clarify that, the Dutch government has an open and less policy letter. Uh, there's a law, open, uh, the law open government. So we do have uh, strict regulations. We haven't got a formal policy within the Dutch tax administration yet, working on that continuous process. Um, but we're working on publishing our own software based on the law, not based on our own internally policy. So just to get the organization up and running, see what's needed to open source your own projects. It's kind of sort of, yes, you need regulations, but you also need to change your mindset. And that's one of the biggest things we're trying to achieve. We're used to having everything internally. So not focusing about, oh, we need to open up our own software. Now the focus is, oh, we need to open source our software, open up our software to let everybody see, the whole world actually see what we're doing in our software. That's a big change. Even for management, that's the biggest leap of faith, actually. Like, wow, what are we doing? Yes, we're sharing the way we're developing. Yes, we're sharing what kind of tools we're using. Yes, we're sharing how to set up our code uh, and which technology we're using there. That's a big step if you're used to keeping everything internally. So working on a policy, but we're actually by doing it, sharing what they learned, having uh, meetings around that, um, learn by doing. And the policy, yeah, you can uh, address the policy based on what you learned. So. It's getting there. The policy will get there. But you need a lot of people to convince to, to make it work. So, I believe we have. Mirko, how are we uh, on time? Because three minutes, right? Nine, oh. nine minutes until the next presentation. So okay. Well, take a few more yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Irish, so I'm glad to see that Dublin is a source of <laughs> inspiration for you guys. Uh, normally, good ideas get lost after a few hours spent in Dublin. So, it was lunchtime, so. You know, you, yeah. Obviously, you were in the. I kept them sober for that. Yeah, yeah, I think it's you. sober, and you, you wrote it down before you lost it all. Um, often with OSPOs, the focus is on uh, software, open source software that you bring in and use in your products or services. Uh, but what about vendors that sell to you, or have you thought about uh, what requirements you will put on them from what you've learned yourself? 
Yeah, there, there are two ways around that. So uh, first of all, setting up a standard as a country, that helps a lot. So we use it as a mechanism to force, uh, well, force, but trying to force vendors to open up. There's an experienced guy with uh, getting a software bill of return from, from a vendor. Um, that was the second thing I wanted to mention, but I, <laughs> I was, uh, I'll get to that. Um, um, He's experienced on getting a S1 from the vendor. We, we requested uh, in one of the procurement, we actually requested a software bill of material um, and we got it. So uh, that's one way to address at least open source in a way, right? At least you know what's, what's in there. Um, but I think there's, there's, for us, there's plenty of opportunity to uh, dive into that topic and come up with, with ideas. Uh, I was in a panel. I think it was yesterday um, where Kira Koons from Ericsson mentioned that they as a supplier get asked, how do you stand against, uh, or uh, what is your stance on open source and do you actually actively contribute? It's an open question in the procurement process, but of course it, it looks better if you have a good answer like, yeah, we're involved in the open source community. Yeah, we actually make contributions, uh, maybe do also financial support of our dependencies. Um, that could be a way, asking that question during the procurement process of your vendors could be a way. Um, and then uh, something else, uh, I think one of the the, the, the the trends, well, maybe not trends, the storylines during this conference was open source, uh, open search, right? The, the, after the rock pool of uh, Elasticsearch and then uh, open tofu after Terraform and now Falky after Redis. It's like, what, what is your stance as an OSPO on how, how pure do you want to be uh, open source? Do you actually um, go along with the license change of the vendor? Or do you say, okay, no, we put a stop to that. The moment the, the vendor changes the license to, to business source and not open source, um, do you then take the stance with the open source community? Uh, that is also an opportunity I see uh, when it comes to being in, in contact with the vendor. Yeah, and I'd find out. Um... The biggest question we added on the procurement phase is, is there, are you able to open uh, an S-bomb and share the S-bomb? So it's not a strict rule yet, but working on that. So at least there is a mention about sharing the S-bomb uh, in the procurement phase. So that's a step. Maybe Carl, if I add it, since I do a lot of S-bombs and vendors, uh, the, mo the most small step and the most easy steps, I know we're talking about S-bombs, but when you talk to vendors, ask them for their open source point of contact. This is how we started in the German automotive industry. It's the most simplest step, say, in your procurement people say like, we want our vendors to put up their open source point of contact. So we're not talking as bombs complicated, just their open source point. That already triggers the account manager from the vendor. What do you mean, open source point of contact? Like, yeah, no, yeah, we want somebody that we can email if we have questions about the open source. And no, we do not want it to be your lawyer. We want to be somebody on the technical side that can give answers on, hey, you put this. So we started with like, not even SBOMs, we started with like Excels, then we later on with SBOM, but just having that open source point of contact. And you know what the sneaky thing we then did? So because I'm behind OSPOS, we invited that point of contact to our next open source meeting. So that was like the customer, aka usually a big vendor, like so big company, so Mercedes, Volkswagen, or Porsche, invited their suppliers to be like, hey, we're doing this meetup about open source. You're the open source company. Can you please come? And they all showed up. And exactly that's the point where uh, we created the interest. They're doing uh, this kind of work. We are doing the actually sort of same uh, work and sharing what was the experience was really helpful and still very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, closing question, I believe. Yeah. If I may uh, follow up on what you said before that uh, all the uh, code that you produce has to be public uh, regarding the law, right? And, and so that's what I wanted to, to, to follow up on. Has that already happened? So is there a repository for all the Dutch government uh, source code that has ever been produced being publicly available? There is a website where uh, developer.overheid.nl, so it's really Dutch. Uh, there's a website where I believe 2,700 different repositories are already available. So different organizations are sharing the GitHub repositories, also GitLab repository, I believe. So there's a space. 
Um, the biggest question is, is it open source as, as a reusable or is it just opened up and shared? That's the question. Uh, we don't want to open source our, our projects and just be open. We want to make it sure we want to make sure that it's reusable for others and make it better and building a community around that, making our product better with experience from others. Not only yes, it's open. Good luck with it. Uh, yeah, I hear a lot of. Let people. me narrow this down a little bit. So now, uh, imagining a new project's going to start in the pub, uh, Dutch government and they are going for producing some code for anything. So that is supposed to be open source and published, and so they they have to be have to follow these uh, rules, right? So it's it's as you it's said, a goal. It's, a, it's a law. It's a goal to do that. It's a law. It's a goal. It's a it's a law. <laughs> yeah, that's the difference from the Dutch law. It's it's the law, but you're allowed to do a little bit more uh, different than the law itself says. Some so. some deviation allowed. Uh, allowed. A little bit, yeah. yeah um, Open, open unless there, there are a lot of unlesses and you can hide behind the unlesses. So that's a little bit of a challenge, but the goal, you need to figure out a way to get to the point where you start a new project and make it open. So there's a long learning curve to get there. And we're trying to get there by learning, opening up projects that are already wrong, longer running. So it will take time, but we'll hopefully we'll get there. It's a goal. Yeah. So yeah. I think we're there, there have been Dutch citizens time, yeah. that file public open request. So they're having citizens filing with the government, I want to get that source code and have then published it, even the, go the government couldn't themselves. Because again, so you just file a public, uh, what is it called? Public, uh, oh, yeah. a public request. A the public request. Opening up. And then you get the source code. So several citizens in the Netherlands have been actively filing those kind of things. They're like, hey, you talked about this project at this <laughs> conference or in the newspaper, where's the code? Just to add to that, you can, you can do, you can hide behind the LS. So, Hmm. Yeah, so so the next speaker is Olivier. Um, oh, great. Then we'll make room for you.